All right, John, Mr. John Hagen, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Ian, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so John, first of all, we're, you're in Colorado. Is that where you're at? Yeah, I moved around quite a bit, Los Angeles, Kansas City. Um, and then, and now we ended up, we live about 35 minutes outside of uh, Denver, Colorado. Very cool. Very cool. And I know, so all that, a lot of moving around has been, been very involved with some of the biggest in really D to C marketing. I know you've been on the operations side and just like super tactical, strategic, tactical, but hands on very much um, in a number of really, you know, name, very, very high name recognition companies and, and agencies. Um, can you just give us a quick tour of the stuff you've been up to, let's say the last five years? Sure. Yeah. So um, I got into to digital marketing back in 2016. So a little bit longer than five years ago, but uh, I was the first media buyer at Structure. It was called Structured Social originally, and now it's just Structured um, with Nick Shackelford. So I went to high school with his business partner, Jake Schmidt. Um, and, uh, I was working in a barbecue kitchen and heard that Jake Schmidt made the fidget spinner go viral. And I was like, okay, like I was, I was also, I was in marketing school. I was doing my thing there, but I was, uh, not enjoying, you know, not seeing any progress in, in the, you know, traditional education route, like so many entrepreneurs do. Um, and so I, I heard that Jake had made the fidget spinner go viral. And so I, I reached out and I said, uh, teach me, you don't have to pay me, just teach me. Um, I'm free labor. And uh, that sort of started this crazy journey for me. So I about six to seven months after that, um, moved out to Los Angeles. Um, it started as it's funny, I was telling the story yesterday, too. It started as meme page blogs back when that was like a thing. Uh, we were paying we, we were we had our own drop shipping Shopify stores, we were paying uh, meme pages to promote our products. And I was like, uh, very, very strategically thinking about this, even though that's not a very strategic endeavor. Um, and then that kind of, when, when Nick came into the equation that turned into uh, Facebook, you know, advertising. So we were taking, we, we took the concept of, of drop shipping and applied it as so many did to, uh, to, to paid social. And within six months, we were spending seven figures a month on Facebook. And I was brand, I was like, I was 21 years old, brand new into the industry, had no idea what I was doing realistically. Um, and we were able to take the success that we had from those drop shipping stores and essentially build structure based off of it. So Nick was still at Common Thread Collective with Taylor Holiday. And, um, and, and we were, you know, kind of like a side gig at the beginning. We were, we were, he was filtering over some of his leads to us. And I mean, it's, it's funny because at the time these were small businesses or smaller, but uh, one of our earliest clients that was like not a drop shipping store was Snow Teeth Whitening. Um, another one was Posh Peanut, which is a massive success at this point. Detox Organics, um, you know, a, a, just a variety of, uh, of, of really successful e-commerce stores. And, and, you know, it's funny, I was telling the story yesterday too. And like, it sounds inc crazy at this point, but like back then, everything, everybody was popping off with that kind of stuff, right? Like it was, CPMs were so cheap. The cost of traffic was 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 just extremely affordable. And we were able to purely by applying Facebook ads, uh, build some pretty cool Shopify stores. So from there, I wanted to see, you know, I was like, this is really cool. I want to build one of these e-commerce brands, right? Like I don't want to do the whole, I, I didn't want to do the whole agency thing. I was really new into it. I just wanted to kind of get a flavor of every, you know, a taste of every flavor. And uh, coincidentally, through Nick, I met a guy named Etienne who owns um, who owns a business called Pirle in Germany. So I started as ambiguous as this is selling women's jewelry online in Germany, um, and uh, nice. worked in Germany. Was there all the time. Had a, a, just an awesome, awesome company, and uh, we were able to scale that company from uh, I think I was employee number fifteen or something like that to to over two hundred employees in two years. Wow. So it was just. It was also again showing me kind of the power of uh, you know ecom and 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 online online businesses and online advertising, um, and then from there I started my own agency. So I, I was this was back when um, the term dark posting was not a thing. Like nobody really knew what dark posting was. I learned dark posting from Josh uh, Snow, 
uh, we were dark posting at Structured uh, through influencers like Floyd Mayweather, Rob Gronkowski, Chuck Liddell. And I was just like awestruck as a 20 something year old kid that we were like having access to the back end of Floyd Mayweather's Instagram account. Right. <laughs> and, and then when I got to Pure Lay, I was like, okay, you know, I saw that move the needle at Structured. Influencers were such a big channel for us at Pure Lay. And so I said, okay, that 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 strategy can't be reserved for just the A-list celebrities, right? Like there's got to be something there for um uh for your everyday influencer. And so that was a, you know, I people like I said, it's commonplace now, but approaching German influencers and telling them in English that we are going to dark post through their account and pitching them on that, uh I mean, they had no idea what it was, right? It was it was very like intrusive feeling to them, and it was very uh, just just novelty, like a novelty task. And so, we were able to do it though. Uh, it, it took a lot of grinding, but we we dark posted through a hundred some odd influencers, and that was one of the big reasons that the brand was able to grow the way that it was, right? Like wow. we're selling costume jewelry imported from China. We were trying to figure out why was it moving the needle? Why were we able to move the needle so much? And how do we hijack that? And it really was obvious that it was influencers. So then it turned into, okay, how do we do everything possible with influencers? So we had product launches, custom collections, events, um, you know, dark posting, um, paper posts. And, and it really just created this at that time. Again, now this stuff is all commonplace, but very innovative, uh, in- innovative influencer uh, uh, built brand. And so I, t- so I took that strategy and launched it for brands in the United States. So dark posting. So the agency that I found it was called Volt. Um, it just recently, about a year ago, exited to Acceleration Partners. Um, and uh, and the primary service offering that it promoted and offered was dark posting. So we had, um, you know, we founded the agency 2019, um, 2020, somewhere in there. And, you know, launched into the pandemic, which was obviously also a boost for us. Uh, but uh, it, it was predicated around dark posting. So uh, originally it was a side project for me. Um, and because of the successful, uh, you know, attributes of dark posting and also still the novelty elements of it, we were able to spend $36 million on our first calendar year of business. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. and scale some pretty cool brands. So that's that's kind of and then now today I'm 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 the director of marketing at a wellness company with a with a wife and a nine month old at home. So yeah. um yeah, that's a little bit about about me. Nice, John. Yeah, it's that's that's insane. I mean, so I know you know you've been living the living the dark post life for a while, right? <laughs> but can you just walk us through for people who don't know what dark posting is? Can you just walk us through just from a first principles. What 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 is dark posting? For sure. Yeah. Um you know, I think of marketing on two planes, right? Like, uh, like if there's an X, Y axis to marketing, um, and there's obviously way more attributes to this, but um, I think of it from a perspective of influence and then a perspective of authority. Um, and I can dive into both and, and why they why they're both effective and different. Um, but when when I think about influence, so dark posting is the action of connecting an influencer's uh, advertising, you know, ad account or, or rather their profile, their Facebook and Instagram profile to the back end of a brand and running ads through that influencer's handles for on behalf of the brand. And there's a variety of, um, you know, there's a variety of, uh, uh, of, of pretty enticing, uh, characteristics of this, right? One is you run, you run ads through the likeness and image of the influencer, Two is you gain access to their engaging audiences to deliver those ads to, to build lookalikes off of, to, you know, to perpetually run ads against. Um, and, and it really results in, you know, I think that like, especially today, um, your brand as an asset is one asset that your business has, right? It used to be, that was all you ran ads through. It was how do we, you know, te- and, and these, these things are all still extremely viable concepts, but it's how do we test creatives extremely quickly? How do we, um, you know, how do, how do we, how do we uh, run ads myopically through the lens of the, of our business alone? And I think now it's, you know, there are so many different assets that you can tap into to help elevate your brand through the lens of either influence or authority that we can, um, you know, bring those brand partners into our ecosystem, create content with them and push that content to our followers, to their followers, to cold traffic, to really the whole 
uh, ecosystem of, uh, you know, a, an ad account. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about dark posting. Nice. I mean, so how do you go about, so you have a pro product X, you want to find influencers. How do you go about finding them? How do you go about negotiating these deals where, you know, maybe they're not doing a post to their, they're not like doing an organic post, but they're, they're just saying, Hey, I'm going to rent you access to my audience and to my account. You're going to, you're obviously going to pay for the ads. How do you go about structuring these deals and how do you go about finding people who would be a good fit for doing dark posting for specific products? Yeah, it's a really good question. Influencer marketing is such an interesting, I mean, the whole, the whole ecosystem of, of advertising is in such an interesting state following like iOS and just the, 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 incre the insane increase in competition. Um, I think that the most important thing when it comes to influencer marketing and working with influencer marketing agencies is how much data do they have access to, right? Like if you go, if you flash back to 2016, most influencer agencies at that time were just talent bookers, right? They just would, they, they would find brand A that was interested in working with influencer B and connect the two. And then that was really the whole service that they provided. A lot of times they didn't even have any concept of how a discount code, how a coupon code, how many times it was used um, or any data associated with the campaign. Like today, that's just completely not acceptable, right? Like that's just never going. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it, I think the reason that it worked at that time is because traffic was so cheap. Influencer re or Instagram reach was actually real. Um, and now it's such a competitive cluttered space that the best influencer agencies are the influencer agencies that actually have access to as much data as possible so that they can say, okay, you're a health and wellness brand, for example, with Soul, the business that I'm with now. You know, um, we've seen these influencers convert historically very well for health and wellness brands. They have high CTRs, they have high CPC, you know, they are low CPCs, they have, um, you know, and in general, they could, their audiences are transactional and can convert. Um, and, uh, and, and those, that is like invaluable in my opinion, right? Like I've worked with influencers. I've worked with celebrities, for example. Um, I, I won't, you know, I won't name the brand, but I've worked with A-list celebrities on a brand and seen them as brand partners completely flop, even oh, wow. though they're posting all of the time, even though they're really in the weeds of the business. Um, and there was one specifically that was an energy drink, drink brand that we used to run ads for. And we were plugging in A-list, they, they had incredible connections. We were plugging in A-list celebrities and like, you would have not even noticed that anyone posted on the back end of, wow. the, of the Shopify. It was that level of like not transactional audience. So, you know, there's a great influencer agency called 456 that I've worked with the, the managers there, the influencer uh, marketers there for a long time. And, and the reason that I continue to work with them is because they have a wealth of data at, that they've collected from brands that they've worked with anywhere from home chef to um, care of vitamins to dime beauty to, you know, to, to, a, to a, a really impressive portfolio of brands. And along the way they've collected the data along with those. And, and so that's, I think that that's the most important thing. Uh, that's super interesting. I mean, it brings up another question, which is how do you go about actually tracking results and attribution? You mentioned coupon codes and obviously there's all sorts of, different ways of slicing it. Just I'm curious your, your thoughts on different approaches there. Yeah, it's it's a really great um, question. And, and I, I, I fell in love with attribution when I was at Pure Leg, right? So, uh, you know, one of the when you focus on right so like if you have uh let's just say you have a croatian brand well there's three million people in croatia right so the the fact that like a it's more important to spend your your advertising advertising dollars efficiently but b the amount the amount of touch points that a user experiences if you're advertising at a high level with large budgets is like it ha you you run out of scale a lot quicker than in the u.s right so when I was working for the German brand, even though Germany is obviously way bigger than than a, you know than Croatia, um, but we we saw that phenomenon a lot quicker than brands here in the United States would experience that type of like ceiling. Right. And so I started diving, diving, diving into attribution, and uh, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask because I think I was more confused the more that I dug into attribution than I was. It's definitely not an easy topic. There are PhDs that. 
Um, I've taught study attribution full time for Facebook. And I think that there's a couple of important principles to keep in mind when you think about attribution. The best analogy that I've ever heard for attribution is that um, attribution is like a diamond. And it's like you're reflecting, ref refracting and reflecting light off of that diamond as you, you know, move, move, move an orb of light around it. Every way that you're using to advertisers, to, to, you know, to people in the data measuring and tracking space, because it's, a, it's, there is no universal source of truth with attribution. There's just, uh, different in, in terms of optimizing in, in, in performance marketing when it when you look at attribution is constricting an attribution window facebook obviously with ios is now modeling conversions and i think that that basically just means that they're making conversions up like i don't see i don't see any yeah. real modeling going on here it really just seems like they're like taking kind of a, a coefficient guess where they apply a, an efficiency metric on top of your ad spend. And as you open up those attribution windows, you see that the, the revenue more and more. But I think that what's the most important thing is, is, is finding the real account. And to me, that looks like constricting the, uh, the, the attribution window as much as possible. Charlie Tishner has been, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he has been like, on top of this since like nobody was even thinking about attribution or talking about attribution and performance marketing. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Pure Lay, I saw a video of his where he was talking about um, one click, no view, one day click, no view attribution and, and why that's, why that's a really important attribution window to understand. And I mean, that's, that's the crazy thing is I remember being in like 2018 and telling people about that attribution window. And, and these guys were like heavy hitters in the performance space. And they didn't even know that you could change the attribution window on Facebook because it wasn't a topic then, right? We just kind of took the data at face value. Every business was making money, so you didn't need to dig in any further. And, and, and that was like a novelty idea is like, why don't you constrict your attribution window? But when you do that, the way that I look at it, and this was kind of the conversation following post iOS that I was having with a lot of brands is the way that I look at it is if you take a one day click no view attribution window and you map that to where how it relates to a seven day click seven day view attribution window or what, whatever attribution window you have at your disposal, um, you can very easily say like a one day click uh, no view attribution term turns into X at a seven day click seven, view, you know, one day view attribution window. And so I think that while when you do that and you constrict that attribution win window down to one day, you are optimizing off of what you know is to be the realest data that you have at your, at your fingertips. And so it's like, it's like if you're a baseball player and you're optimizing for grand slams, right? Like, right, right, right. or a line drive right down the middle. Right. You know that you, if, if you're only counting a win as a line drive right up the middle, you know that you're going to hit, a, you know, a, a, a grounder that goes through the gap. Right. You know, you're going to hit right. a home run. that's a pop. Right? You know, you're going right. to have more success than, than just those line drives up the middle. But if you can if you can, you know, uh, basically increase your level of suck in the ad account by by constricting that attribution window, you'll you'll just have much more real data that you're making uh, actionable changes to. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I'm, I'm, I mean, what? Uh, what do you think about how do you look at attribution when, you know, let's say back in 2016 for many years, it was people were pretty much in D2C. A lot of people, I'll say not everyone, but a lot of people were only on Facebook, right? So they're running one platform hmm. and then you add in another major platform. And then, so what do you do then? Like, how do you look at attribution when you have multiple major platforms in the mix coming, coming from where you started, you think, you know, like your MER or whatever, from one platform. Just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah. John, sorry, John, sorry to interrupt. Um, John, 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 sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, I think that it comes John, down so, to John, sorry to interrupt. Um, we got, I'm going to turn off you. my, sorry, sorry about that. Just we'll cut this up, but, um, you're kind of breaking up. I'm going to turn off my camera. Yeah. Okay. It's a little choppy for me. Do you want me to turn okay. off my camera? Yeah, well? yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Perfect. And we'll we'll cut cool. that out. So, all right. So, just backing up. <clears throat> I don't know. Did you catch the question? About I did. The, yeah. Okay. I, I, okay. I, I hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We'll just we'll just drop back into where wherever you when you started to answer the question. I'll I'll we'll, we'll cut from there. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. 
Cool. So yeah, I, it, it's a good question. Um, I think that when when you're the, and you're totally hitting the the problem on the head, right? Like the problem is, and it's also just a, a further exasperation of the problem is that, that there are no single channel brands anymore, right? Like attribution was easier when you had when you limited the amount of inputs going into the you know into the Shopify store. Now now you have every brand has their hopefully at this point if you're a successful brand at least you have you know your advertising budget is broken down across five, six, seven channels. And so uh, adverti- understanding the mix of how channels play with one another is very, uh, that's where it starts to get very complicated because a variety of reasons, but, you know, display, for example, if you're operating on the trade desk, I, I believe the trade desk offers a 90 day click, 90 day view attribution window. You can change it, but like, what the hell are we supposed to do with that when you only have a seven day click, one day view in Facebook, right? So, I think that when you when you boil it down to its like uh, bare principles, the important uh, elements are defining a click through attribution model that does that's not too open to the the kind of like um, arbitration of the platforms, so that you can just set a target in that platform and and try to make that target as apples to apples as. Uh, possible. You know, one of the problems with the whole situation is that Facebook, if you can, if you just sit there for five minutes and consider attribution from Facebook, like the statistic of a ROAS or a CPA is really bullshit, right? Like there, it's not this myopic ecosystem of advertising where $1 goes in and how many dollars do we have that are coming out? Like in reality, it's much more complicated than that. And it's much more reliant on you understanding that those statistics are just efficiency metrics. That's what they are, right? If you treat them like efficiency metrics and stop viewing them like it's like some sort of ATM that you're that you're tapping into, then you can increase the efficiency and in turn the incrementality of your ad dollars, regardless of the platform, right? Improvement is improvement. And as long as you're using the correct uh, you know, attribution uh, uh, window, then then that improvement should turn into down the road, more profitable advertising, more efficient advertising and better bottom line and top line performance for the business. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, it's, it's always been a, it's always been a challenge, especially coming off just from our perspective have, with the non Facebook led agency. You know, we've always been a lot of times coming to the table where there's an offer or a business that's doing amazing on one channel and then it's then we added another another channel to mix to diversify and scale. And then, you know, Apple, it's not always an apples to apples comparison out of the gate at first glance at, at a sort of, with a sort of, you know, let's say a more naive um, uh, framework. So, so yeah, I appreciate, appreciate hearing all that. Super interesting. I mean, we had um, Thomas Hopkins on a while back. So he was the head of growth at masterclass. And um, or wow. I, forget his, I forget his specific position, but it was he was basically he was conducting all the traffic across literally every channel you can imagine. They're spending up to a million dollars a day on like radio, wow. TV, wow. YouTube, obviously, Facebook, um, all these different influencer accounts. And they also, if I'm not mistaken, do a lot of dark posting through the through their sort of mm-hmm. gurus. And he was saying, you know, at that scale and with that many number of platforms in the mix you need to be looking at all these things like you're saying, like, like, like that strictly click based, but then also looking at real, you know, modeled marketing, mix modeling, et cetera. So super granular and super holistic. And he said it was like flying a, like a world war two aircraft where you have all these analog dials and you're sort of triangulating between everything. <laughs> so, um, I love uh, yeah, it's, so it's super, super interesting. I, I love, love how you're, um, how you're thinking about things in terms of, um, attribution for dark posting specific stuff but um i mean do you see things changing in terms of is dark posting let's say still a strategy that that still is working great are are things shifting in terms of how you need to approach it or are people markets less responsive how do you have you seen things change in the past couple years yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, things have changed so much. I, it's like sometimes I just sit there and I wish that things would just slow the hell down a little bit in terms of changing because it's like it really is just especially with the emergence of TikTok. Um, it really is just a situation of, uh, you know, perpetual state of flux. 
um, which is what makes it fun and interesting too, right? I, I say that in the, in the same breath, I'll say like, I'm glad that things always change because it makes the, the target ever moving and the game, uh, it can, it's extremely complicated and, and that's fun, right? And it's hard. It's, it's fun to approach difficult challenges. Um, you know, I think that what has changed from my perspective, as far as dark posting goes is, what used to be the successful strategy was predicated on the success of the influencer a lot, right? So like these influencers, what we would see time and time again is a direct correlation between an influencer's performance on Facebook and Instagram as an actual just paper post and their success as a, uh, you know, when we bring them them into the ad account and and run dark posts through them so you know it kind of just turned into this thought of like okay if an inf influencer converts they convert and what we would do is we would use the paper post as a leading indicator for if it was worth it or how successful the dark post would actually be we had um outliers to that equation but uh, most of the time there was a direct correlation between the efficiency of the paper post and the efficiency of the the the, the dark posting now, I think today, the thing that has become increasingly more important um, is, is the emergence of user-generated content to a successful dark posting play. There are agencies that are really specializing and, and doing great work in, uh, in user-generated content. And I think that today, it's, it's much more of a quantity play and a and a quality of content play than it is a quality of influencer play in my opinion like it used to be does the influencer convert then bring them into the dark posting ecosystem and now i think it is what exact message do we need to tell our audience so that they move off of the platform that they're on whether that's tiktok or facebook or or, or snapchat or whatever it, it might be and onto our website right so i think that you have a requirement of a lot, it, it, it's its kind of less, not less exciting, it's just more difficult. You have a requirement of a lot more content and uh, it, it's required that you put a lot more time into your creative brief than you used to. I mean, we used to give a, I, I mean, barely any creative direction to these influencers and they would create the content, post it directly on their Instagram channel, uh, Instagram account. And we would take that content and just throw it to a VA video editor have them you know splice everything together and then throw that into an ad and nowadays we're having you know users like uh, much smaller influencers uh create very specific pieces of content based off of what we know what works in conjunction with a variety of different hooks and a variety of different types of influencers and a variety of different creative briefs and then throwing that into the advertise you know into the ad account and that is proving to be a lot more successful than simply having like, you know, one influencer without a creative brief that can sell the hell out of anything, throw it on our Instagram account and we repurpose that for paid social. Got it. it makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> brings up another, well, a bunch of questions. Super interesting. What, I mean, what, what works? How do you actually decide how to structure these creative briefs and who do you feel is doing a really good job with this currently out, out in the D2C space who people who are listening to this could look at their ads or their, you know, their dark, their dark posts ads mm -hmm. and model. Just curious about the structures that you see working, what doesn't work and who's, who's good at, uh, who's a good case study for modeling. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Brand or agencies, agencies that are doing the content output side, I think that the most important thing there is that they are using the same level of um, optimize, opt, optimizing and optimization as uh, the, 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 the actual media buyer is in buying the ads, right? So they're focusing on Okay, what are the four hooks that we're going to throw out there? How are, how how is the video going to start? How how many iterations of this content can we make? And then in constant communicate, this is more important than ever. I think they 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 need to be in constant communication with the media buyer so that when something works, they know what works, they know why it works, and they know how to replicate it so that they can in turn scale up that 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 um that account. Another thing that I think is important that we haven't really touched on is a little bit outside of your question is. 
I think nowadays, especially if you're in the CPG space, right? Like I think nowadays it's more important than ever to understand your CAC to LTV. Like that's a number that I, it sh kind of shocks me that it's still a little bit of a novelty concept. But like if it, I, I hear this fairly often from CPG founders or, uh, you know, head, directors of marketing. And that's like, I'll say, what is, you know, that they're saying, hey, our ads aren't working. And I say, what is your CAC target? And they say, $25. And I'm and I'm scratching my head because, okay, so what's your LTV? Oh, our LTV is $150, 12 months. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you have a $150 LTV, you are wasting your time with a $25 CAC, right? Like you have, if you don't understand that relationship per channel, then there's real. I, I think that there's no way that you're going to be able to scale an ad account successfully. So understanding the relationship between your CAC to LTV has never been more important. Having a UGC content creating partner that is uh, optimizing their content, similar to how an ad, a media buyer optimizes their media buying. Um, and, and then a brand that does a very good job of all of this is on it. Like on it just continues to impress me with how, if you look at their square dance or you look at, you know, the offers that they're putting out there, it's very clear and obvious as to how they're able to uh, beat out the competition and be everywhere. And that's, I think that through an understanding of the importance of dark posting and user generated content, uh, an understanding of their ad account and how their CAC to LTV relationship works so that they can equip their media buyers with a sufficient CAC to be able to acquire their customers and um, uh, uh, combine that with an offer that converts. And I think you have a really, you know, you have kind of the, the, the numbers that we used to see in the early, you know, in the earlier 20, you know, two thousands. Um, so yeah, those are, those are a couple of. That's awesome. Yeah. You think, um, so qu quick question on that. You mentioned, you know, CAC to LTV. Let's just assume sort of typical, if there's such a thing, typical uh, COGS, you know, and, and margins, et cetera. But okay, let's say someone has a 12 month LTV of 150. What, what CAC should they be aiming for in terms of really trying to maximize the, the potential of using pay channels to scale? What was the, what were the numbers again? So just the, the example you gave was, you know, someone with a, a 150 LTV, 12 month LTV, um, trying to hit a $25 CAC or CPA, what would, yeah. what would be more, more realistic? Let's just assume kind of typical margins, typical cogs, et cetera. Yeah. I think starting a, a good starting point is a three to one. Uh, and so that's, that's three LTV to one CAC, uh, um, so, you know, uh, in that scenario, I would start out at a $50 CAC. Um, and so that's, you know, just in my off the cuff scenario, that's double the, and that, that's not a, that's not an unrealistic scenario. That's double the CAC that you were previously offering, right? So you're spending twice the amount of money for half of the output, but the game now really has turned into like, if you can't put to, if you can't put together an offer that can compete with all of the private equity money that's going into e-commerce right now then you're not going to be able to compete with them. And from my perspective, right? Like it's a, it's a game of how much can you possibly spend to acquire a customer because that just gives your media buyer that much runway to be able to test, optimize, scale, spend, put you in front of additional people, um, you know, and, and increase the halo effect around your business. So, you know, I think starting with a three to one CAC to LTV is, is, uh, is, is a good, is a good, you know, kind of place to start. And then along with that, uh, you know, there are channels, there are some, like, I think Triple Whale is good. You know, I think that Triple Whale is a pretty good uh, platform for a, a brand that has, that doesn't have enough money to invest, you know, $100,000 into a me, uh, an econometric model or, or, you know, a data scientist on an annual basis to be able to tell them what their data looks like. So I would recommend anyone checking out Triple Whale. Um, if you haven't, you know, if you haven't already, because it has these numbers and it has these numbers holistically in aggregate broken down by SKU. Um, it doesn't necessarily have them broken down by channel, but I think that that's where it comes into a play of like you, you fudging and playing with the, the ad spend that's going out and what channels facilitating that ad spend and then understanding how that affects your rolling 12 month LTV. I, that, that's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, what it's interesting you bring up on it too, because I mean, how many SKUs does on it have? They must have, they got a bunch, right? <laughs> yeah. And what what do you see? I mean, it, it seems like a lot of times, I don't know, uh, 
there's a tendency to sort of fixate on the front end, but what sort of transformations have you seen in the businesses you've been involved in? Let's say like the costume jewelry business. That's super interesting because I'm sure people don't just buy, they're not just buying like, it's not like buying a car, you know, you're going to buy, you're going to buy one set of jewelry, one piece of costume jewelry. You're probably going to buy like, you know, five more if you really like that, um, or you might be able to upsell people. What have, what kind of transformations have you seen in terms of scale and also ability just to, to spend more um, on the front end by really focusing on the back end where maybe a company was super fixated on nailing that front end product, but ignored the back end, but then by incorporating um, really more holistic back end multi product cross sales, upsells, et cetera, was able to uh, really transform the business. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. I'm sure the listener can tell at this point that I'm I come from the paid social ecosystem, so I think of things in terms of acquisition. But what you're talking about is yeah, equally, you know, it's the yin to the yang, right? It's equally important it for for a successful holistic e-commerce business to be able to, you know, it, it's like everything that I just said would be remiss if that business didn't have a solid uh, retention focused strategy on the back end. So yes, uh, you know, I think that that is equally, so you have on one side, understanding your CAC to LTV and, and working on reducing your CAC or rather, a, a, you know, hitting a, a target CAC to grow the business. And then on the end, you have all of the principles that are required to, uh, you know, focus on retention. One of the coolest products that I've seen the two products that I've seen come out on the retention side are SafeOpt and retention.com. I at a triple whale conference a while back and it you could have heard a pin drop in in the at the conference because we, he just has developed uh, a very interesting data play with with um with retention.com. Um and essentially it allows the the brand the ability to advertise uh, apparently this is you know just me regurgitating what what he walked through there but apparently in the U.S. the the, the legislation it is opt out not opt in so you're able to through retention.com and safe opt we actually use safe opt but and, and through retention.com you're able to um, remarket to customers who have never given you an email address which is pretty nuts. It, it, and, you know, I think it's pretty unprecedented in, in the e-com uh, industry. So, you know, that that's just one product that I've been like, that when I heard about it, I, I couldn't believe that it was a real thing. Um, but I think that increasing your LTV is is equally, so SMS, email, all the, you know, all these channels that we um, take for granted, uh, working through those. And, and also, you know, along with that, it's not just these tools, like launching SKUs is as important to increasing LTV as I think that having those tools fully cranking, uh, you know, can possibly be. Um, there's another interesting, you know, story that that was, it was about 2021. We, we worked with a brand called uh, Dime Beauty. And when Dime came to us, we were doing like, they were doing like $60,000 of revenue. It was one of the biggest case studies of the biz, of, of Volt, the agency that I, that I founded. They were doing $60,000 a month of revenue. And within 18 months, we were zoning in on the $100 million mark. And so it, they were, you know, the, it was cranking on full cylinders and we were spending a lot of money on paid social, a lot of money on influencers, all predicated around the dark posting strategy. And with this business, um, we had the conversation, they live in Salt Lake city, the, the founders of that business. And we, we sat around the table and had this conversation of, okay, this is really interesting. This is really great. Um, how do we, you know, what we have captivated the audience of 30 something year old mom bloggers, right? Like we have them, you know, really, really dialed into, we have uh, a really effective product that we're selling them. What else do they buy? And we actually effectively launched two brands off of the back of Dime with, with them. Um, one called Row Wellness that sells uh, children's skincare supplement or not supplements, but skincare products and cosmetic products. You know, think eczema, sunscreen, those kind of things. And and, and then we launched uh, Divi, which was uh, a brand that they launched with um, Danny Austin uh, that that solved a hair, uh, you know, a hair loss supplement for postpartum um, women in postpartum. And both of those businesses worked extremely well. I, I heard the other, I don't, I'm not involved with either of them anymore, but I heard the other day that Divi is pacing at uh, $40 million top line this year. And I think that, you know, 
it's anything from making sure that your retention, uh, your standard retention tools are set up properly all the way through to, you know, thinking creatively around um, is retention.com feasible? Are there new tools out there that I'm not working with? And then all the way to like, should we be launching new brands off of the back of this one? Um, because, you know, we don't want to, we have a good thing going here and we don't want to infringe on the, the, the customer avatar and launch something that doesn't make sense under this brand, but could we launch, you know, sibling brands alongside of it? Yeah, that's unbelievable. And let me just backtrack a second because <laughs> the numbers that you just dropped in terms of before, <laughs> before and after, can you please restate those for everybody? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this was the case study of all of of our of of Volt, right? So um, we were we we stepped in, and this was, and, and I want to, you know, this is peak like pandemic, and we stepped into this business called Dime Beauty. They sold their main seller was is an eyelash boost serum, so a functionalized cosmetic product, right? You see a lot of lip stains, lip lip, uh, you know, like a, a lot of different lipsticks, a lot of different mascaras, a lot of different moisturizing creams, that sort of thing. And I think one of the reasons that this, I know one of the reasons that this brand was able to jump off like it did was because we were selling uh, uh, an eyelash boost serum. So it's a very clear, you know, product uh, market fit. It's a very easy to understand what does this product do? It boosts your eyelashes. And it, and, and it was completely unrepresented in the market. So we stepped in, I think it was March of 2020, and they were doing $60,000 of revenue a month. And I believe that we hit 10 million in that year. Um, and so that was an incredible insane. scale. That is insane. It, it, it was insane. It was, it was beautiful. Like it was just, we were, kind of, everyone had that, like, what's going on here? Kind of, you know, kind of like, uh, that's how the, the office felt at that time. And the next year we didn't slow down at all. So the next year we continued in high investments into influencers, high investments into Facebook. If I had to guess what their investment or if I had to extrapolate what their investment breakdown was, I would say it was damn close to 50-50 influencers and paid social. Like this was like a, a dual channel brand. I'm not recommending that for anyone right now. But um, and the next year we were you know, we were spending a, a ton of money on Facebook with on the back of influencers and it was extremely efficient and they were zoning in on the hundred million dollar mark. That's insane. And so just sort of for uh, folks like me, you're a little bit slow. So the, you said 50, 50 Facebook. And then, so the spend going to the influencers, that was just to get them like straight up paying them to post organically. That was not dark posting or is that we're talking about? Yeah. Running? So the the bulk share of that spend from a Facebook perspective was on their influencer content. So the way that we would structure these deals with the influencers, we worked hand in hand with the guys over four, five, six on this relationship. Um, and the way that it worked is they would contract out an info. So they would take a look at all of their data at their disposal, right? That I talked about earlier. They would uh, identify influencers that were high converters, um, some higher than others, some more expensive than others, et cetera, et cetera. And they would book a deal with the influencers. They get an influencer budget confirmed from the from the brand owners. They would book a deal with the influencer. And that deal would inherently come with paid social access. So dark posting access. That influencer would post. And we created this cadence that was like, as soon as that influencer posted, as soon as we were able to get the content from that influencer, it was shipped to a video editor, edited, ready for paid social, and then live the next day. So we were launching, I mean, and and this is, you're talking about, you know, in some months, $3 million, $4 million worth of ad spend um, and, and and on the back of 50 to 60 influencers. So we were doing that over and over and over again. We had four or five media buyers alone on the account at one point to be able to facilitate the video editing requirements, you know, the the builds alone within with, with those influencers. And um, it was some crazy shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable, man. That's 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 crazy. And and so it was year two. They started launching the other brands, the sister brands. Yeah, yeah, year two. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, so one of their biggest um, kind of unique um, elements of 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 their parent company was that one of their they had access to one of their dads owned a hundred million dollar company that was sold to Newskin. So they had access to uh, like a state of the art skincare manufacturing facility. 
Like I went into this thing a couple of times and I mean, it's like straight out of a movie where you have like doctors walking around with lab coats wow. and, uh, you know, just like they're pouring product into bottles and they produce product for Dr. Squatch and uh, native deodorant. And I mean, you have bottles all over the place with recognizable household brands. And these guys had access to the R and D process and just, you know, state of the art wow. materials. So everything that they were selling was the highest level of, of product. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you, you just knew that what you're going to get out of that facility was obviously like, you know, state of the art, science backed, research driven, you know, high quality skincare product. That's so cool. And just to circle back to something else you said that was pretty incredible. So you had five media buyers, buyers working on that account, spending like three million a month. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about how it was super important to have your creative team just as obsessed with iteration and performance as your media buyers how do you from an operation standpoint how do you integrate those those two sides so to speak i know a lot of people tend to silo them but how do you actually put them together so that performance and results is actually driving the creative and media buying decisions for for both parties yeah it's a really good question it's one of those that i've never seen really solved the way that i think that it could be solved you know like i i I think keeping them in a silo is, is I, I feel like a lot of times what happens is you have this desire to bridge that gap. You kind of have the yin and the yang of the organization at your disposal, right? You have the, um, the creative who doesn't get, usually because they're creative and they're great at what they do, doesn't give a shit about data. And you have the data team, the, the media buyers who don't really care what the creative looks like. They just need it to work. Right. And so you have like I've seen it happen so many times where you have them come together, you have a conversation around. OK, so, you know, and, and I think that in some regard, this is what needs to happen. You each each side of that aisle needs to decrease in polarity. Right. So you cannot have a creative team that doesn't know what a ROAS stands for. You know, and you cannot have a, a media buying team that doesn't care about the aesthetics at all of the content. They just need it to work. Like You have to have those two sides of the aisle kind of bridge that gap and so i think that it just re revolves around constantly communicating between those two sides having some sort of dashboard is is essential to communicate from the ad account to the uh to the creative team um and then coming up with some sort of rep in that i kind of touched on earlier uh of of okay what are we testing when are we testing it how long what is statistically significance uh what is statistical significance within this test um, and if, you know, if this works, what happens if it doesn't, what do we do then? Right. And so like, I think that's where it comes into multiple variables at the same time, analyze the traction and the success and then, and then move in that direction. Right. I always like use the analogy of marketers are just hunting dogs. Um, you just need to, you know, you need to understand how to split test, gain statistical significance as quickly as possible, and then move over to the variables that work and cut the ones that didn't. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And so you've obviously been able to, you know, you said, it could be done better, but I, it's very clear from just our conversation that you've been able to merge those two to a large, to a large degree and, and uh, reap the results, reap the rewards as a result. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, John, yeah, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. Go, just please. one additional thing yep. on that. I think that is uh, something that I've focused on. It is an area where you see a lot of media buying success, but I think that one that's not really talk talked about enough is your ability to m create meaningful results in an ad account is also entirely dependent on the amount of what I call them equitable assets that you're able to bring to the table, right? So like your, your ability to enhance the success of the ads is also, is, is in part, in my opinion, dependent on uh, creative iteration and creative testing and building that mechanism that I just spoke about. But at the same time, there are, that's kind of how I view dark posting, especially in the earlier days was it's, it's like a cheat code to short circuit the requirement of that testing, right? Like we were working with these influencers and these influencers cost 30 to 50, some of them cost 30 to 50 to $60,000 a month. They're not going to create a piece of content with six hooks and seven, you know, yada, yada, yada. They're going to create one piece of content. If you're lucky, post it on time, if you're lucky, and that's what you get. Right. But at the same time, 
they bring such an equitable brand building asset to the table that it essentially nullifies in some regard the importance of that creative testing by bringing the, such an equitable asset to the table, right? Publications can do the same thing. Um, and, you know, influencers and publications, that's really where I see the, like what I brought up earlier, which influencer influence and authority. If you're able to bring influence and authority or some co combination of those two things into the ad account, it makes all of the split testing, not necessarily easier, but that much more efficient and, uh, and, and just that much more successful in the ad account than if you just have so, you know, if, if your entire strategy is just some content creator that has no notoriety in the industry posting, you know, creating a bunch of content for you that you're running ads through. So, um, yeah, that's just a little bit of, of an additional, I think, value add. Yeah, no, totally. <clears throat> that's, that's so, I mean, was that even on the influencer side? I mean, probably now they're very much clear about the value of just you having access, you as an advertiser or a brand having access to their audience, their, you know, their actual account, public facing page or Instagram account, whatever. Was that something that was, I'm just curious about in the early days, so to speak, was a lot of that not really recognized on the influencer side or even the, the influencer agents side in terms of the, the just the inherent value of authority and um, of influence of those coming from those assets versus, you know, Here's, here's the content. I'm just wondering about how that mm, perception of value has changed over the years. Yeah, 1000%. You know, we used to be doing deals um, with influencers where uh, essentially the general sentiment that we would promote with the influencer was that we're interested in the paper post and the dark posting thing is just kind of icing on top. When in reality, we were interested in them both equally and the payment structures would reflect that, right? Like this was such a new thing that the influencer, like nobody knew how to price this and it created an opportunity for you to be able to price it more advantageously for the, the business, the brand than for the influencer. Because it's also just true that at the end of the day, like the influencer doesn't really need to do that much more in order to dark post than they do to just post the content, right? There are tools. Lumanu is a, is a really incredible tool. Tony Tran is just one of the most smartest guys in the industry um, that make connecting an ad account to an influencer's backend like a one-click process. And so from the influencer's perspective, especially before the value of this was truly actualized and, and understood, from an influencer's perspective, they were just like clicking one button and then it was done. And then we had access to their ad account and they got more deals because of it and the, and were rebooked by the brand because of it. And, you know, those kind of things were more important or were important to them. And for us, it was like, wow, they're charging a lot of times two, 3% of ad spend on the, on the, um, you know, on, on the content. And, and uh, it worked out for everyone for a while. And now I think influencers have understood the, that there's more value to, the dark posting side of the equation than people wanted to let on. And now that pricing has, in my opinion, gotten almost too expensive, but it's just to require, it's, it makes a requirement for you to price this strategically so that you don't kind of start the integration with a gun pointed at you. Um, and, uh, and so it's, I think it's still very much priced more fairly at this point and more e evenly, but it, it definitely makes it harder because you're starting from a, from a higher cost point. Just curious, last last question on that. Um, so two to three percent back in the sort of early days. What what are you seeing influencers charge for spend through their their assets currently? Five percent plus an upfront fee is pretty standard now. From Got what it. I'm seeing, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times they'll just add a little bit on top of their posting, uh, their posting paper posts re required budget, and then and then the, and then you pay five percent of ad spend or one of one of those two things, right? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. The influencer believes in their ability to convert and wants to rely more heavily on the percentage. And sometimes it's, uh, I just want, I, you know, I don't know what this is. I'm not an expert. Just give me a, an additional amount of my retainer or my paper post fee. Um, personally, from an influencer perspective, that's what I would do as well, because, you know, in this industry, there's uh, everybody's not honest and upfront with all of the information, and that can create you know difficult situations for the influencer. And, and and I think that in light of transparency, just a flat fee along with the content is probably just the best thing for all parties. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw 
video of Snoop Dogg actually. And um, I'm not sure it would apply to like to a brand situation. He was saying, you know, if you want to have a Snoop Dogg verse on your track, it's $250,000, just flat fee done. And, you know, he's going to be in, a, in and out in an hour. That's it. It's all you get. Um, and if you, you know, then if you wanted to show up in the video, same thing, 250 K and he's going to be there in and out in an hour. And that's it. <laughs> it's just super, super, super clean, super simple. And there's no real back end accounting magic or, you know, right. distrust that can take place. So, yeah, I mean, I see the, I definitely see the value of that. It's really interesting, you know, like I think I, I as I'm sure everyone in e-com, like Air, the movie about Michael Jordan was such an incredible like depiction of where influencer marketing has gone today and the value of, and, the, and the power of it. But it's it's interesting, you know, I think that in some degree, I don't know, it just depends on your risk portfolio as an, or your risk profile as an influencer, your risk aversion as an influencer. Like there, there, there is something to be said about betting on yourself. Yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, right? It's just how, how the influencer wants to be paid. But um, I've seen influencers do percentage deals with dark posts that make a fee of, <clears throat> you know, small influencers that make a fee of $1,000 uh, per, per post that were able to spend two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 behind their ads. And they're making 5% of that. So, you know, like it, it does in some scenarios, especially if you're a smaller talent or if you're, you're just a content creator that doesn't have an influencer personality. Like there's a lot of money on TikTok now for impressions. And that I think that's really interesting for those content creators because if it just, you know, you're, you're not going to make a large flat fee, but if you can create a situation where you get paid a decent amount of money for, for, your, for the attention that you're able to garner, um, yeah, it can be worth it. And really fascinating to just pick your brain a bit, John. And um, if people want to reach out and, and connect with you, what's, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, not crazy huge on D2C Twitter. I'm more of a spectator there. LinkedIn is incredible. Um, you know, I'm 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 huge on LinkedIn. Just John, just my name, John Hagen. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to find me. Um, please reach out. I love you know. I, I've started <laughs> I've started two businesses now based off. I, I've almost thought about reaching out to LinkedIn to do a case study. I've started two businesses now based off of a LinkedIn direct cold outreach direct message. So like, please, I you know, reach out to me. I'm I, I love talking. Obviously, I love talking and I love talking about this stuff um so uh don't hesitate to don't be a stranger yeah it's another another a topic for a future conversation how how john <laughs> leveraged uh, direct outreach on linkedin to, to start two two multi multi seven figure businesses or I, I maybe even bigger scale but um that's fantastic man so thanks so much john for being on our show really appreciate it and uh, yeah looking forward to our next chat and yeah man thanks for all your all your knowledge and wisdom you just dropped Awesome, Ian. Thank you guys so much.